Bose is the presenting partner of Beyond the Grid. That's because Bose QuietComfort 35 II goes beyond what you would expect from a pair of headphones. Just flip the switch to experience the industry-leading active noise reduction feature and all distractions of the world around you fade away, allowing you to focus fully on what matters to you. Hello, I'm Martin Brundle and you're listening to Beyond the Grid. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. Now it's hard to know how to introduce this week's guest because he's a guy some of you will think you know pretty well already. He's been communicating his passion for Formula One to TV viewers around the world for the past 22 years. And his enthusiasm for the sport remains as infectious today as it was when he retired from racing. I'm talking of course about Martin Brundle. Although many of our younger listeners will be more familiar with his commentary than his racing career, don't forget that he was a mighty fine peddler who on his day raced and beat the best of his generation. And I include names like Ayrton Senna and Michael Schumacher on that list. Martin's done much in his career and I always love catching up with him because his take on the sport and what he achieved in it is both compelling and unique. Here's what happened when we caught up recently over a cuppa in the Mercedes motorhome. Martin, welcome to Beyond the Grid. You've had such a varied, eclectic career, it's quite difficult to know where to start. So I'm going to say this to you. You retired from F1 22 years ago. And so lots of people listening to this will be more familiar with Martin Brundle, the commentator, than Martin Brundle, the racing driver. How does that make you feel? Well, I still think I'm a racing driver who commentates on, on races. I think like a driver, I mean, kidding myself. I still race a bit here and there, but that's my mentality. I, I started banger racing on old cars when I was 12. Somehow found my way through touring hot rods, touring cars, junior single seaters, back to touring cars, and then raced the great Ayrton Senna in Formula 3. And bang, I was a Formula 1 driver, still selling Toyotas during the week uh, for the first few races of 1984, till I realized I'd actually become a professional driver. So I'm very proud of both of my careers in motorsport. Uh, the media one has probably gone even better than the, than the driving one. I look back on my Formula One career with some frustration because I underperformed my potential. You know, I, I, I raced hard against the likes of Senna and Schumacher and Hakkinen and my contemporaries, the, the big stars of that time. I won a lot of races in Formula Three, World Sports Car Championship. Daytona, Le Mans, you know, I, I, had a, I did a lot of winning. Um, so I look back with satisfaction on my driving career and some frustration. My TV career is a complete mystery to me. I didn't want to go in the commentary box. I moaned and kicked and screamed. Did you really? Yeah, I, was... I just didn't want to do it at all. I wanted to be a Formula 1 driver. Refused to accept that you weren't an F1 driver? Yeah, I thought I was driving for Jordan in 1997. Now I'm up in the commentary box with the great Murray Walker and they started forming up on the grid and I, and I was screaming inside stop wait I'm not ready you can't go yet I'm not ready to race you know and then I got some quite nice comments on the, the following week about my commentary uh, and I, well maybe it's not that bad but I just didn't get the point of being commentator. Uh, How long did it take for you to get that point? When did you get it? Uh, a year or two and then you know people started to say very nice things about what I was doing and I was getting good write-ups and I realized I was adding value to people's enjoyment of a sport that I loved in Formula One so uh, and I kind of realized then I I came to terms with the fact that my Grand Prix career was over but I carried on racing of course uh, with Nissan, Toyota and Bentley at Le Mans and some other stuff and driving the McLaren two-seater whenever I got a chance at Grand Prix and driving the cars for TV so I could still satiate my absolute desire and need to go fast Um, but then I was building a a media career at the same time. Desire and need to go fast leads me into what actually attracted you to race driving was it was it speed was it a desire to impress the girls was it I mean what can you just wind back the clock can you remember that first moment where you thought, this is what I wanted to do? And can you explain why you wanted to do it? Well, I used to build all my own racing cars in the beginning, which I enjoyed um, on the technical side and just being hands-on, just winning, 
basically just that need to be faster than everybody else um, you know even in my banger racing days my Ford Anglia 105e so I think and that thrill of sort of you and the car versus the track and the elements and your main competitors making it go faster making yourself better being brave down into the first corner all the skill sets you need to to win races just and adrenaline is far and away the best drug to get hooked on and uh, I think you do as a racing driver and that you kind of almost as a especially as a Formula One driver you're kind of almost rated every day of your life it's not an, an annual review or a career review it's how fast were you you know on that day testing practicing qualifying racing we used to do a lot of testing back in those days and you're kind of measured and I like that I like that and and in a say in many respects I think that's why I love doing the TV work because being live on air is about 30% as thrilling and scary as sitting on the grid which is one of the the best I found so far in terms of the thrill and I, I like the edginess of it I like the instant decisions and calls and and just being challenged in every way mentally and, and not so much obviously physically in the commentary box but that that is it's all part of it so uh, my analogy then is finished by you know how fast was I? How big is the TV audience? How happy are the TV audience? So you, you, your, your metrics just transfer to something else. Well, let's put some flesh on those bones. How fast were you? I think in a sports car, I was one of the very best. Uh, in a single seater, I lacked a tiny bit. So I could beat, I, and I did, Senna, Schumacher and Hakkinen on my day. I beat them all. Um, in the same car on the same day but and Michael I could outrace quite frequently through 1992 but he was he was a new boy back then to, to Formula One Michael Schumacher but the key part of that statement is on my day but of course the great champions and the multiple winners ha, ha, don't have a, a day they're always on it every day and that's the that's the key difference what triggered your day do you believe in form in cricket and all sport or, or do racing drivers have form in that way yeah, I think you do I think you get a setup at a circuit circuit suits your driving style I, I was always on the back foot with my career a little bit I, and the, the main reason for that was I smashed myself up in 1984 uh, smashed my legs up uh, in a Tyrrell so I lost momentum and then I moved into other Formula 1 teams but what, where that really hurt me was that as I knocked my left foot off my leg, which thankfully they found a way to screw it back on. Sid Watkins, Prof Watkins, stopped them in Dallas cutting my foot off, which would have been the end of my racing career because they were three pedal cars back then. They were going to amputate yeah, your foot. Gonna amputate my and foot. Sid stepped in. Yeah, got me home to Harley Street. We found a guy who found a way to screw it back on, um, which was fine when you've got a two pedal car because your left foot's only got to work the clutch pedal. Then we went, uh, it's a three pedal car, and then we went to two pedal cars, obviously with paddle shift gearboxes, and you've got a throttle on your, like a car, throttle on your right foot and a brake pedal on your left foot. And I couldn't left foot brake with any kind of finesse. So because I, you lack feeling yeah, in that just foot. My foot right. it doesn't work very well. So I was still right foot braking. Uh, through then, then when I had to compete with Michael and uh, Mika, it was, a, it was a hindrance because they could rotate the car in the slow corners and just use their left foot on the brake and pick up the throttle, transfer between the two pedals in a way that I just couldn't do. So unfortunately that crash in Dallas probably uh, is, is the key reason I underperformed. Uh, and also I need, there were some other things, I, uh, I don't think I ever quite had enough self-belief, which is strange because whenever I got in a Jaguar, I felt invincible and I usually was uh, in the World Sports Car Championship. So, Sports about your head, about your confidence, and I think that's the big difference between the the greats and the merely very good. Do you think your lack of karting had something to do with it as well? I mean, what was it? It was dirt, dirt track, yeah, and touring cars. Racing. Had you been karting from the age of four? Do you think you would have been? Yeah, it would have to... helped me. I never kart raced. Um, I never forget a day Ayrton overtook me in Formula Three in the in the rain at Silverstone. He went down the outside of me uh, into Stowe and it was torrential rain I was leading and he 
it went so deep. I, I actually always remember shouting out loud, see you wouldn't want to be you out there. It went all the way around the outside of Stowe on the karting line, of which I had no experience of because I never did karting. Came out in front of me. Uh, and how did he do that? The race was red flagged because Kiki Mansilla went off. So as we're going round to the grid again to reform for the second part of the race, I thought, I'm going to try Ayrton's line. Went down the outside, hit a puddle of water, down the grass, skimmed the barrier, just survived. Got back to the grid, thought that was a bit of a lucky escape. <laughs> Restarted the second part of the race. This time Ayrton won the drag race um, down to Stowe. I followed him home, I finished second. And on the podium I said to him, your line into Stowe in the second part of the race didn't work, did it? And he said, I don't know, I didn't try, it was too wet. He just had this knowledge, he had this gift, and he had this experience that, that I didn't have. But that's, that's no excuse. So, I, you know, it, it is, you've got to get yourself into the right cars, but the best drivers always end up in the best cars. It's extraordinary, isn't it, how you beat Senna in Formula 3, yet you say one of the reasons, one of the things that held you back in Formula 1 was a lack of confidence. You would have thought that would have made you the most supremely confident driver out there to have beaten Senna, yet it didn't transfer yeah. into Formula 1. No, well, I think that confidence, that knowledge, uh, is in and out of the car. So it and had a certain gravitas. Even yeah. in F3 days? Or? Yes, even in F3 days. He was clearly, you know, I, I, we both went to Formula 1 at the end of 1983, straight from Formula 3. But let's be honest, Senna was going to Formula 1 anyway, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, so I, had the, I was in the Tyrrell, which was a bit of a challenge from time to time. And as I said, I smashed myself up in six races in. And so you lose momentum. And I never really got in the right team at the right time. I ended up at McLaren, but only because uh, Prost didn't want to drive it in the McLaren Peugeot. And, uh, so you end up with some challenging situations. Whereas in sports car racing, Tom Walkinshaw was the boss. He just thought I was the best thing ever. And it gave me the confidence. I barely ever scratched one of his cars. I won loads of races for him in touring cars, in, in Formula One cars, uh, in, in sports cars rather. And so I think, I think it may have been, maybe I needed that kind of environment to really give my best. Whereas maybe Senna was a, a bit like Prost and, and Michael Schumacher, where they uh, galvanized a team and made it their team, got all the right people around them. So I think a lot of this um, opportunity is driven as much out of the car as what you achieve behind the wheel when you're out on track. Now, we've talked about Senna a bit already. You've been asked about him hundreds of times, but was he ever a mate just through shared experience of, you know, Snetterton on a rainy Monday test date? Was that shared experience ever a bonding factor for the two? Of you? We did have lots of good chats. I remember after the race in Cadwell Park where actually he crashed in qualifying. We were trading pole position lap after lap after lap until he went off at the mountain. How he didn't break his legs in that crash, I don't know. And I'm pleased he didn't. But his car, when you saw his car afterwards, it's a miracle he didn't break his left leg. Um, so we had a long chat after the race. So it was, it was friendly. But then as the season unraveled for him and I started beating him and went into the last round ahead of him in the championship it got a bit fractured he ended up his car on top of my car we had a massive near miss at Snetterton it all got a little bit personal he got his license endorsed twice for dangerous driving and, and he saw me as part of the British establishment all of the traits I saw in Ayrton in 1983 in Formula 3, I saw later on in Formula 1, he, he was pretty convinced the world was against him and the FIA was against him and so on and so forth. But he had a, a gift, and I've already told you the Silverstone story, which explains that Ayrton knew where the grip was before and during a corner, whereas most of us were during and after a corner. He had a, for me, he's the greatest driver of all time. But then, don't you often think whatever era you're in, you thought it was the best or whoever you're up against. But uh, others would argue differently. But even when you're in F1 and you're you know, in Japan and, and, and you've been through so much together that in your careers, that did he ever let his guard down with you more than other drivers? We had a chat occasionally. And funny enough, I met him in the lift at the hotel the night before he died. And it was a pretty tense weekend, as we all know, with Roland Ratzenberger and Rubens Barrichello. Uh, you know, somewhat different, but serious incidents. Um, 
and yeah it, it, no we were never we were never close that was partly my fault I guess we, we'd sort of come through together he was annoyed my career started better than his in Formula 1 he was with Tom when I was with Tyrrell fifth in my first race second in my sixth race I think it was before I smashed myself up the following weekend so um, no I, I yeah we would acknowledge we'd stop and have a chat I've seen a few photographs of us chatting away especially when I moved to McLaren I took his seat at McLaren when he elected to go to Williams if you, if you think about it so uh, but no we never really sat down and talked about old times or, or um, had a drink together you've been in such a privileged position in that you've raced Senna you've been um, teammate to Sterling Moss in touring cars, teammate to Schumacher, teammate to Hacken. Is there a common trait among all those guys? Yes, I think it is the confidence, the gravitas. I mean, completely different characters, actually. The, the four you just mentioned are wildly different characters. You just come at it in different ways, um, in different eras to an extent. Uh, the I tell you what it is, it's those little moments where you get this glimmer of opportunity and somehow they it falls for them, they make it happen. And that's the moment where you miss the gear, snatch the brake, or somebody runs into you or the car breaks down and it, it somehow they've got this uh, Can you give winning. Me an example to that? Could we say it's Belgium ninety two yeah. an example of that? And yeah, just to that's the, that's the example that was in my head, actually when it is I'm following Michael, we're third and fourth, we can see the two all dominant Williams but it's a bit of a wet dry day. I come around Le Combe at the top of the hill and I'm thinking, it's drying out, I felt grip, I felt really good grip there, I think I'm going to, I've got nothing to lose, I'm fourth, I'll go in for slicks. We came out um, of just before Stavolo, Michael runs wide, bounces down the grass, he's got a very low front wing on the Benetton. I'm thinking he must have broken his front wing. I could still see the Williams. I was, it was a little bit wetter down there at Stavolo. And I hesitated. I hesitated to go in the pits. And it was a critical moment. So Michael's now behind me. He sees how blistered my rear tyres are when we get to the bus stop. I'm thinking, because you had to go down the pit lane before the bus stop then, shall I, shan't I? He's now got nothing to lose. He thinks he might have damaged his front wing. He sails down the pit lane, gets the hot tyres that were ready for me, if I'd have wanted them, comes out and wins the race. And it's just those little tiny... Why didn't you pit? Have you asked, that question? Have you asked yeah, yourself that question a thousand years? <laughs> fairly regularly, actually, even all these years later. Uh, and what it was, was, you know, it's like, hang on a minute, I'm third. The two Williams were all dominant that year. It was very hard to beat. And I finished third a few times. And it was uh, Schumacher's out. It's a little bit wetter down here. Don't go one lap too early on the tyres. So it was just that slight hesitation. What I should have done is followed my instincts at the top of the hill that there was grip. Michael would then have had to wait for me to get my tyres, which would have stuffed his race. I'd have gone out of the pits and won the race. Instead, he got his first victory. And it's, you know, it's tiny little turning points like that that, that make the difference. Momentum. Is that Momentum, confidence and that certain champion's judgment and gift. We'll get back to Martin in a minute. Before that, let me tell you about The Economist. As someone who works in F1, I find myself on a plane every week for nine months of the year, and I'm always looking for something to read. My latest discovery is The Economist. Don't be fooled by the title. It's about far more than economics and finance. It's been around for more than 170 years and it covers a range of subjects from politics and business to science, technology, arts and the environment. And their aim is to help readers prepare for what's going on in the world around them. And let's face it, in today's world, facts matter more than ever. As an F1 fan, you won't be surprised to hear that I usually flip straight to the technology section. And in the latest issue, there's a fascinating story about a flying car. I won't spoil it, but it's very 007. The Economist is the smart guide to the forces changing your world. For your free print copy, just text GRID to 78070. Once more, just text GRID to 78070 for your free print copy. Now let's get back to Martin. 
what did winning the World Sports Car Championship do for you and your career? It, it was, I think, a reward for... I was very good in long distance racing. My son's the same, actually. Give me a car for two and a half hours and I'll bring it back in one piece as fast as anybody at any time on the fuel and you get in a rhythm, you get in a fantastic rhythm. Ask me to do a qualifying lap and beat Michael Schumacher and I'll be a tenth or two shy uh, because it's a different quality, different discipline. So I think when you, when you get into the longer races, I think the year I was lucky enough to win them all, I think I did a dozen hours all told. And I could just drive forever on the pace. Um, so I think it was just a reward for being very good in that field and you know nursing a car, working with the team. And they, these are big operations. I mean, Le Mans with five Jaguars, fifteen drivers. Make, actually, the logistics makes Formula One look a bit small a bit in many respects. And uh, I love those cars. You could really push the massive downforce. You could really you had to boss them about a little bit. A big seven liter V twelve over your shoulder yeah, you had to stay on top of those I had a confidence in this it's odd isn't it I had a supreme confidence in those cars that I never got in a Formula 1 car and do you think you could have beaten a Schumacher if he'd been your teammate in a sports car well I did race Michael because uh, in 91 in sports cars and I, you know, I had the measure of him he, he was clearly the best of the young Mercedes drivers mm. but you know Michael grew into the driver he was you know I raced him when he was in his very early stages of Formula 1 he just he learned how to galvanize a team, get everybody pointing in his direction. A few crafty tricks along the way, which is another, which is another important element of the, of the champions. Um, no, no, I, the, the answer is, uh, that's trying to say I'm as good, I was as good as Michael Schumacher, which clearly I wasn't. Now, the man who ran the Jaguars was Tom Walkinshaw. Yeah. Um, for the listeners who aren't aware of him, he was, hard-nosed Scott is that a fair description it's tough Tom? yeah but here's a common theme throughout your career what would you have achieved had you not come across Tom Walkinshaw well very little I'd have been a Toyota dealer in West Norfolk so I was racing in British Touring Car Championship I heard about this new BMW championship so I, I wrote to Tom Walkinshaw and said look I'm 19 years old I think I'm going to be a top touring car racer there's a race coming up at my home track at Snetterton Will you please put me in the car? You wrote a letter. I wrote a letter. Yeah, which sadly I don't have a copy of. And, and he replied. And he replied, basically. And they gave me a test in this car. And I turned up and I had an epic race with uh, Andy Rouse and Frank Sittner, two of the top touring car drivers of the day. They put me in the car next time. Now I'm up against Alan Jones, Hans Stuck, Nigel Mansell. 19 year old Brundle against yeah. guys and who I, just won the World Championship. Yeah. And I won. I won the race and it put me on the map overnight. So literally, without writing that letter and Tom going, yeah, give him a chance, I would have been, lit I would have been absolutely nowhere in motorsport. Long, long ago, we sort of faded away from saloon car racing, run, running our own car. So that, and that beating those great names put me on the map overnight. How often did you speak to Tom? He wasn't in Formula One for that long, was he? But he was sort of coming and going. He was a wheeler dealer. Was he yeah. a friend? Was he? A yeah, Tom. Tom was like a second father to me. So he was. Uh, he trusted me, and I trusted him implicitly. So it, whenever he was heading off somewhere, start something new, he wanted me to be involved and to give it a try and give him some feedback. To his frustration, I mean, he talked me out of leaving Formula One at the end of 1987 because he saw I was just spinning my wheels and going nowhere I was, had a year in the Zach speed and the first thing happened is I won the Daytona 24 hours with the gang then I won the World Sport, Sports Car Championship and it, next thing is I'm back in a Brabham so to Tom's absolute annoyance every time my career my cred took an upturn I rushed straight back to Formula 1 I then did it again for 1990 and was part of the Le Mans winning team and won some other races for him uh, and by the end of 19, uh, you know, for, for 91, I'm back in a Brabham again. And then Tom went to Benetton, of course, with Ross Braun and, and Flavio Briatore. And Tom made sure I got a, a team shirt in that against Michael Schumacher. So uh, Tom was absolutely pivotal to my racing career. 
You say he's your second father. Can we just talk about your old man? Is that is that where your passion for driving came from? What made Martin Brundle want to be a racing? I mean, I, I know it takes me back to something I said earlier, but was yeah. it, did it come from your dad, your mum, your mates? Your... Uh, my dad, were, well, sadly, we lost my dad at 59, and Tom was only about 61 when he died. So they, they, they didn't hang around very long, sadly. Um, two or three of my mentors, Ken Tyrrell was another one, actually. Um, great people who you look up to. And um, so dad was a rally driver. But I, and I did a bit of rallying. I have done rallying. I've done rally cross, truck racing. I've done everything. Done everything, yeah. Because I just love going fast. Yeah. So, I, I was, and we had car garages, so I could build my own cars, basically. Old, old, anything that had failed its MOT it was unsaleable at the end of the used car lot. I take the windows out, put a roll cage in it, plumb a radiator into the back window so that it wasn't exposed at the front, strip all the interior out, and then go and tell my dad to take it off the uh, inventory because <laughs> it was a bit rusty and it was never going to sell so I've turned it into a racing car and go, and go I ran a grass track I currently live four miles away from all these years later and this was late 1970s so uh, that's, that's sort of what got me into it and mum did a bit of autocross as well and my parents were just hugely generous in that they just let me get on and do this sort of thing nobody ever suggested I should do it. I used to save up for a karting magazine, let alone the kart, so that was out of the question. But because I had access to these old end of the line car deals, r rusty old Fords, that gave me the opportunity. Um, and so dad would drop me off on a Sunday morning. I'd race all day and when he'd finish selling cars, wh whatever time that was on a Sunday night, he'd come and pick me up again and I'd have it all loaded up and ready to go. And then one day a guy ran into me in a Ford Zephyr 6, great big car, came after me with a crowbar, after because I just won the race and he wasn't very happy about it. We used to have a mixed final when I, yeah, I got, and he was like, we're out of here. So we lied about my age, said I was 16 and went hot rod racing with Speedworth on the ovals. And then it started to get serious, but, or did it really? I had three slick tires and one wet. So we put the three, <laughs> two slicks across the rear and obviously at oval circuits you only went one way round those so my best two wheels were on the crowd side my worst wheel but with a slick on it was on the right rear and then the wet went on the right front and that's how I went hot rod racing Do you know this reminiscing I, the smile on your face makes me think you look you look back at this time very affectionately I do because we were winging it and somehow made it through which is why I don't always have a lot of sympathy for some of the ballerinas today when they think they're having it tough. Um, are you still involved in car industry, road car? I mean, do you still sell cars? Do you have any garages? No, or? we sold the garages. Um, ten Did years, your brother Robin? Ten years. Do that? Yeah, we, we, we ran them for a good while, but I'm very pleased to say we got rid of them ten years ago. Uh, I'm an ambassador for Aston Martin, so I'm still involved in the mo motor industry in that respect, but. No, we, we, got out, we got out of that business. So the family business is motor racing now. Yeah. So it was inevitable, I suppose, that son Alex was always going to... Yeah, our son's a racer, sports car racer. My daughter's a designer, car designer, but that's, she plowed her own furrow she wanted to. Did she ever race? Did Charlie ever race? No, but we do some Palmer Sport days, and Charlie's very quick, actually. Really quick around there. So, But she hasn't raced. I'd like to see Charlie do a race, actually. Okay. Now... I saw you at the Google Festival Speed recently, driving car number, F1 car number 50... 52 was for me. Two. And you were um, speaking very passionately about that car. The Dan Gurney Eagle Westlake V12, most beautiful car. I think it's a major contender for most beautiful F1 car of all time. Sounded glorious, drove beautifully. It's a great honour and a great responsibility to drive, you know, the, the only American car that ever won a Formula One race. And Dan Gurney's own car could barely reach the pedals because he was six foot two and the car was made for him. So I had two great big pieces of foam, and every time I hit the throttle and the V12 lit up, the, I sank into the foam and couldn't reach the pedals anymore. It was a little bit scary going up the hill, um, but you give it a bit of a go anyway. And yeah, and I also drove um, Sterling Moss's, so Sterling's Cooper T43 as well up the hill a few times, which is very nimble, lovely little car, horrible gearbox, but. I mean, he, he was a giant killer in that car. I mean, so you have driven cars from pretty much every decade, haven't yeah. you? Fangio's, yeah, Fangio's, right Mercedes, the way through to right, up, right up to, I've driven three of the latest hybrid cars, yeah. So you're in a very good position to answer my next question, which is, 
if you had your time again, which cars were the most fun? Which cars would you have loved to have raced? Well, these cars, because I spent all of my career debriefing after every session, end of every day, writing reports and constantly thinking, how do I make my car go faster? And it was, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there, get rid of a bit of understeer, you know, try and make the gearbox work a little bit better, whatever it was. Fast forward, now you've got a car that's close to perfection. Personally, I don't think they're very exciting, uh, as exciting to watch because they don't move around and the drivers can't really make mistakes with the gears or, or what have you. But So I spent all my life trying to go faster. So I would always choose the car that goes the fastest, which are these cars, and they stick to the road. Um, I like driving the old cars because I admire the bravery of the, the craziness of no seat belts, <laughs> but even your fuel tanks so, so somewhere to rest your elbows Aren't it? <laughs> but even your era I mean you walk around the Formula 1 paddock now you walk with a limp Helmut Marco, Nicky yeah. Lauda every, yeah. all you guys are survivors yeah, and yeah. Uh, I mean a little bit earlier you referred to the current mob as, as baller, ballerina, ballerinas I mean well the skills have transferred is it, but is it, is it too safe now do you feel that the people at home watching are thinking these guys aren't doing something are doing something do you think people at home think they could drive one of these? They must do occasionally when they go on some of the onboard shots or if they see a great big car park for a runoff, but they'd be wrong because the cars are unbelievably fast. The acceleration is relentless to the point that it frightened me when I drove Lewis's car. I thought, if I don't take my foot off the throttle soon, I will actually take off because it just never stopped accelerating. So the skills are transferred now to, you know, they break within a metre or two. I mean, we used to turn up in a corner and if you were still pointing in the right direction, in the right gear and you made the apex that was a start now you know if they break two meters too early they've <laughs> thrown the lap away and so the precision with which they drive now and the speed they carry uh, it really impresses me it, it, they are they are brave they're carrying a lot of speed in places the difference is that they're probably not going to hospital or the mortuary if they get it wholly wrong at any given point and the cars I've driven from the 50s and 60s uh, really catch your attention and, and you quickly begin to realise and when I drove Fangio's uh, 196 I think it was the it was you know what if something goes wrong I will actually jumping out of this looks like the best option not running into something in it and but they were pioneers they were gladiators in from post-war years when you know running off the track and hitting a tree and dying in a ball of you know ball of fire seemed obviously just one of the acceptable consequences of being a racing driver. And where do you fit in this? Do you, do you relate to that sort of Spitfire pilot mentality or are you, do you relate more to the current... I, I relate more you know, to those... Halo clad no, I relate more to those days when you really were taking a risk and you, you were doing something. You, you've got to be doing something out there that people either couldn't do or wouldn't do. That's the key thing. So, the old Le Mans? I raced at Le Mans recently. But no Fantastic. chicane? Stick. Yeah, the no chicane. Is that when men were men? No chicane. You're just sitting there waiting for something to break on those. Uh, that's you don't, do you relax? That's the when luck of the draw. Do you relax at 250 no, miles? No, nah, nah, 240 is the highest I ever did, but that's day and night. Uh, 400 kilometres. Um, no, you're keeping an eye on things because also you've got the tram lines and the cat, the, the crown of the road and back markers and debris and a little bit of mist and fog occasionally and the smell of the barbecue smoke and down the motor. In a way, I think it's more dangerous having to brake twice, but back then you were just a little bit like here at the old Hockenheim actually. You, you headed off into the country and really you were in the lap of the gods whether it was going to blow up or break or something while, it, while you're out there. You could make a bit of a difference in some of the chicanes but it was all about the engine. Um, so I don't like it when I see Cox Corner and Eau Rouge for example reduced to being straights effectively, to being full, full throttle zones. I don't like to see drivers coming out of the pits on an outlap and going flat out through Eau Rouge because that used to be a corner where you had to build up to it all weekend until your final qualifying lap and then it's like let's, all right let's get this done we've got to go flat through Eau Rouge now same at 130R but so those challenges I'm afraid that's just life life the way it is um, these days and, and the uh, 
health and safety aspect or is, is it is it wholly unacceptable for somebody to be injured or die in the name of in the name of sport these days um, probably but i do think you need to be a gladiator we'll get back to our conversation in a minute but before we do i wanted to tell you a little bit about bose like many of the f1 teams on the grid They've got a long backstory which begins with a maverick founder, in this case, Dr. Amar Bose. He founded his company in 1964, and today it's still privately owned by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Dr. Bose's alma mater to whom he gifted his business. The company continues to be driven by its founding principles to develop new technologies with real customer benefits. And their game-changing noise-cancelling headphones, for example, were first launched in 2000. But they came 22 years on from Dr. Bose's original noise cancellation research to ensure the highest quality products for you and me. I use them on the plane, and they've revolutionised travel for me, especially when I want to kick back with a good podcast. Speaking of which... Did you accept the risks back then? Did you? Totally. Yeah, and wife Liz knew that. Yeah, Liz is a racing wife. <clears throat> I had two kids, and you still become a very selfish person. And you, uh, when you step into the side, or when you stepped over the side of from one car back in those days, there was a reasonable chance you would be killed, injured, or paralysed, or at least have a nasty shirt. So you treated it with respect, and you, but that was the. So I used to balance that risk. I wouldn't fly on dodgy airlines. I wouldn't walk down the side, and I still don't today, walk down the side of a very busy road. Uh, burglar <laughs> alarms and fire alarms in my house. You, so you try to manage the risk you know, and try and drive safe cars. And that's why I ride a motorbike and fly a helicopter and generally <laughs> take a lot of risks. So I think, I think if you're an inherent risk taker, the only drivers I knew who were apparently totally fearless died basically Stefan Beloff would be a good example of that what yeah. I wanted to ask you, you about you've got to have you have to have an element of self-preservation somewhere in there but then you've also got to be prepared to ris- take risks and die because otherwise and the moments when you really knew if you still want to do it would be again here at Hockenheim or Mons in the pouring rain you're doing 220 miles an hour you can't see where you're going and you press the throttle a little bit harder. When you lift the throttle, it's time to stop. Did you have that self-preservation prior to your shunt at Dallas? Or is that what instilled it in you? Because no, you, it didn't change anything. Because you could argue, couldn't you, that a lot of the guys you say who killed themselves in racing cars hadn't had that warning shot. Something Alain Prost said to me recently was that you have to have a wake-up call. Yeah. So, realize exactly how dangerous it is maybe you had that at Dallas well I had exactly the opposite actually so (laughs) Dallas was a nothing crash Um, I'd already crashed at Monaco when the brakes failed into Tabak in the very low side of Tyrrell I hit my head on the barrier and I hit my head on the racetrack in the same accident both of which and knocked myself out but all of which would probably keep you out of a car for some months ran back and jumped in the spare car but I didn't know where I was Um, just for the people who weren't familiar with that race, did you actually get in the car? I got in the car and then I, I asked Ken Trill, I said, you've got eight minutes left, you've got to get on with it, you're 22nd, with only 22, with only 20 starters back then. And I, I said, no problem, which track am I at? I couldn't, <laughs> think, I couldn't think where to go when I got to the end of the pit, and I was going to go left or right. All right so I, I, I'd sort of come around enough to get myself in the car, and I do remember sitting and thinking, left or right at the end of the pit? So Uncle Ken And they said, took me out, they yeah. leaned in, switched off and took me out, took me away, but... And then, of course, I had a, a, a massive shunt in 94 when Jos Verstappen came barreling down the track and ran over my head. And another massive shunt in 1996 at, in Melbourne. Um, so it's a matter of when you crash in Formula in Remote Race, not if you. You, you all have crashed. I had three big crashes in my career. And I, I was actually Mr. Bring It Home, I must say. I was quite well known for being in the points, you know, especially in sports car racing. I was... Mr. Reliable, always bring them, but I'm actually famous for three very big crashes. <laughs> and so why it was different for me is I got to the end of there thinking, well, I survived all that. I'm fine, I'm invincible. So actually, it probably made me a little bit more crazy. Okay. Now, we, we, we talked about Schumacher and Senna and Hacken and people, but, but Beloff, just to go back to him, bit mad, you say, but how fast was he? 
Oh, Just, he, and for people at home, you were his teammate. Yeah, so, so you you knew him in, yeah. inside out. Yeah, he he was. We came at it in a different way, um, but we'd be in a, We were almost like a, there was a piece of string between us. Either I was just in front of him, or he was in just in front of me. In a lot of races, and I'm normally aspirated Tyrrells. Then he would make two or three moves, uh, like Zanvor. Come on, Martin. Come on. You know he's getting away from you. Come on. Um, and then two laps later, be behind me because he made another move that was actually never on. Had an incident. Now he's you know behind me again on the race track. But he was a very fast boy. Scary to be with on the road. Scary to be with on the racetrack. And he apparently knew no fear. Um, was Gilles Villeneuve a bit like that? I didn't know him, but I suspect he you know from what tales I've heard on the track and flying his heli and all that was a, a little bit yeah. uh, fearless. Yeah. Were you a prankster then? Going back to these characters, you know, were you in the I mean, same era as Gerhard Berger? No, no, what? Gerhard was the. No, no, I was. <laughs> was he another was level? A kid from Norfolk, I didn't know. <laughs> so out of my depth, I was so green. To all our listeners in Norfolk, Martin loves you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was. I was absolutely green, but yeah. Uh, uh, we was it more fun back then? I mean, yeah, you could still yeah, see. Yeah, yeah we, we used to go camaraderie to among the drivers. We used to go to Rio for three weeks. We'd test for a week. Have yeah. a week off, yeah. and then go to the race. It was and hang out together yeah, during that week together around the pool. Well, yeah, it was we. You know, Tom, what goes on the road stays on the road. So yeah. we don't tell stories, but, but we had a lot of fun, and yeah. things happen, and and as happens today as well. Um, but less I think so, possibly I less so. But the drivers are, you know, there's a. We didn't have social media back in those days. We didn't have somebody taking photographs on Twitter. We didn't have mega sponsors who were sensitive to how you were presented in any, you know, at any given time. So it has changed, and, and I don't envy that. Envy the drivers one little bit in terms of that kind of pressure and the media uh, attention that they get. So, but they were they were larger than life characters. There's no doubt about it. Coming from all sorts of directions. Were you ever tempted to try and get involved in the management of Formula One or the management of a racing team to use this wealth of knowledge you have in a race, focus it in a racing sense rather than a broadcasting sense? Well, I've been chairman of the Grand Prix Drivers Association, which was after Ayrton and Roland died. Um, we had a meeting and the drivers decided I seem to be the, the right guy to control it or to run, to run it as it were. My co-directors were Michael Schumacher and Gerhard Berger. I've been chairman of the board at Silverstone, running Silverstone. So it, it, I do like that kind of element. I do, you know, I'm chairman of a charity. And so it appeals to me. And I managed David Coulthard for 11 years uh, and, so on, on the, and ran, ran my own businesses. So the business side appeals to me a lot. But I've been a driver and then a media person through all of that phase. There's a lot cleverer people than me to run this business. And that's why that's why they run it, and I just talk about it. <laughs> yeah, well, not true. I just said uh, Coulthard. Actually, interesting to hear you mention his name. Eleven years managing him. How was he to manage anything you do differently now? I mean, nine years at McLaren. Were there any other options for him? No, I look back. David and I are years later even closer than we were back then which is a uh, is very important to me so we, we got through that phase and we didn't fall out nobody uh, disappointed any uh, neither was disappointed the other on any commercial aspect or we did our best um, David won a lot of races my frustration not winning a Formula 1 race is, is his frustration for not winning the world championship when you had maybe the potential and the opportunity to do so uh, no, we did our best. We took our best decisions at the time. You can't punish yourself. Look back and punish yourself. You did. You, you did your best at the time. Yeah. Okay. So uh, and and DC was a great driver. Has become a great friend, and we work together. We we share a room together. A, a lot of Grand Prix. Mean DC. even now. Even now, I mean, which nobody can understand. You it's actually, like we share a room. We share a room here in Hockenheim. Yeah, we uh, we have a twin room and. We oh have never stopped laughing. Does he snore? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm sure I do as well. No, we're, we're, we're great friends. So, it, uh, and people go like, that. why on earth do you do that? They're like, well, we would probably go and have a beer and, and have a bite to eat. And it started, me and Blundell used to share a room. We started in a hotel in Belgium 
where we were both paying 1200 quid each to be in a room and the walls were so thin we had a conversation through the wall for about three hours and we we're like mate we might as well yeah. share a room and yeah. save 1200 quid next yeah. time and it started like that uh, but good tales um, no. were, you, were you not tempted to manage other drivers as well F1 drivers uh, was the opportunity ever there one or two actually talked to one or two but never quite came off mostly because they wanted exclusivity and I was already nailed on with David uh, but I, I would if I stopped doing the TV I'd probably think of dri- uh, managing a driver yeah okay so look I think a nice place to end this Martin is just how has a life in F1 changed you or do you think you're still the same guy that was or is it taking windscreens out of cars when your dad wasn't looking and putting yeah. a roll cage in and stuff have you changed much do you think I, I haven't has changed dramatically as a person but I've become a lot more worldly uh, and I've my fundamental view of people is that you you know I trust people until they prove I can't trust them anymore I've had to adjust that a little bit I'm afraid in this crazy high finance and pressurized world of ours um, so I'm slightly more skeptical I think everybody gets like that as they get older so I like to think I'm the same approachable person um, but I've learned a lot I've learned a lot the hard way I had some task masters like David Price in Formula 3, Eddie Jordan, Tom Walkinshaw, Ken Tyrrell, Ron Dennis, Frank Williams for a time. They're tough guys. And they tore me apart. And at that point, you're either going to leg it or you're going to put yourself back together again. And I put myself back together and came back stronger. But you, they're, they're, they're tough guys. What do you mean, tore you apart? Oh, my God. Just in, in the deal? The deal? Or the deal just or the, the post-race pr- thing. When I finished second to... Uh, PK in Detroit I went out to dinner with Ken and Nora Tyrrell and I thought I was going to get congratulated all night long and Ken ripped me a new one because it was you know why did you you know even Jackie thought you shouldn't have overtaken Elio in that chicane for second place Elio D'Angelo I'm like oh, hang on a minute did Jackie know that I knew Elio was missing third gear he was coming out of a corner and just not accelerating he had to go from second to fourth so I nipped past him and I nearly put one more lab and I'd have had PK as well for a victory and I was quite upset about that what Ken in his clumsy way was trying to tell me was don't get cocky five days later I was in the wall in Dallas going convinced I was going to be on pole position in a Tyrrell around a joke of a racetrack um, it was just a parkland track lined with two concrete walls uh, it was his way of trying to like keep the lid on me you know, keep, just keep my expectations down a little bit so but no I mean Ron, Ron was tough to drive for when I drove for him. Um, had me on a race by race contract, which is ne- as a McLaren driver is nearly nearly impossible. Why do you think he did that? Don't know. Don't know. It was so you know. It, I smashed David Price's racing car up, a Formula Three car up, and you're not going to do that a second time. I can tell you. And but these guys define you, and in the end, they do you great favors. They do a great favor. And, and you life life's lessons and and they toughen you up because when you hit the track and you start trying to fight somebody you know, when I came into F1 it was Rosberg, Prost, PK, Senna, De Angelis, Mansell, Lauda, Arnu, Tambe, Nafi. So who's who a Formula One in that time, isn't it? Yeah, tough. But Martin, thank you. Thanks for your time. What a great track. Loved it. Yeah, very good, thank you. He's the kind of guy you could listen to for hours, isn't he? Always so informative and articulate, and I loved those Senna stories. And what about that tale of Spa 92? All these years later, he's still kicking himself. That could have been the victory, couldn't it? Thanks for your time, Martin. Always great to chat. Next week, I'll be talking to another big name from F1. And I know many of you are heading off on your summer holidays now, so why don't you take me with you? Just subscribe and I'll appear on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or your favourite podcast app. And if you have something you want to tell us, then just drop us a line using the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid and you can reach me, as ever, on Twitter at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time... Keep it flat out.